All right, let's go through uh, some of the readings on excess in sports, where we're looking at overzealous athletes and parents and coaches and fans and, and everything else that drives us uh, uh, perhaps past appropriate boundaries. In looking at this, we're going to be examining it through the lens of social identity theory. So the basic tenets of this theory is that we want to belong. We want social acceptance. We want to fit in. Uh, we're always looking at the world around us. We want uh, uh, to be receiving praise. We're a good friend. We're a good student. We're, when we're younger, it's a good girl, good boy, good teammate, good classmate, good citizen in society. Uh, and we tailor our behaviors in an effort to achieve that social acceptance. So we might want to do, we might have urges or desires to, to do one thing, but we know that that's a violation of social norms or, or rules. Um, so we, we aren't able to maybe go after what we want to go after because we need to sort of fit in. We need to um, match what the expectations are. Uh, so in, in one way, we might think of this as an element of social control. Uh, so we're basing our desires perhaps on our, our desire for belonging. Uh, so we might even shift what we want and that social acceptance is what we want maybe even more than uh, some of our other desires or urges or things that we want to accomplish. Uh, and the social control rarely comes off as a direct punishment. It's more of, uh, of social consequences uh, for, for violating norms or violating social rules of, of etiquette. Um, so someone might give you a look or someone might tell you off. Someone uh, might talk behind your back or put on some sort of peer pressure. Uh, so there's all sorts of ways that this social control gets exerted um, and, and influences our behaviors. Um, this might come in, the, in, the, in terms, like I said, social norms, if we're thinking about our peer groups or friends, uh, there might be workplace norms. Uh, a lot of times it gets talked about as culture. Uh, there's certain values and norms uh, that your family has, parental pressure. Uh, so there's all sorts of places that are, are, are putting influence on our behaviors. And, and again, the, the basic goal in all of this is that we want to please people so that we are accepted by society or maybe accepted by our, our, our social group, if not all of society. Um, so there might be a, um, an argument that you don't necessarily care as much about society, but you certainly care about your group of friends or your family and if they are accepting you. Uh, so we're, we're, we're really talking about this in terms of behaviors, control, Norms would be the rules, social rules, social etiquette rules, and then deviance is anything that breaks that norm or, or any abnormality. Um, and deviance can actually go in two ways. So it, oftentimes deviance has a very negative connotation to it, but you can deviate from the norm by also being positive. So something like perfect attendance, a model citizen, someone that is, that is better than average is, de is deviating from the norm there and abnormality. Uh, most often, though, we think of it in terms of negative deviance, crime, rule breaking. So how social norms operate is that each group of friends or each group, uh, a collection of people, whatever they're collected for or whatever that grouping is for, um, oftentimes develop their own norms. So you might have college friends that are, um, that have its own set of norms that maybe those norms or those, those, how you engage with them would be different than how you would engage with teammates on a field of play. That might be different than how you engage with your parents and grandparents. Uh, so certainly if you're acting or if you're behaving and, and you're in your college group of friends, your behaviors are going to be a bit different than they are if you're maybe at your grandma's house to celebrate a birth, celebrating a birthday. Um, so those are the types of are, are maybe easy examples to think of when we're thinking about differences in norms best based on what group we're in at any given time. Uh, other, other groups that we may belong to, um, religious groups where you're with religious leaders or other members of a congregation or a collection that all, uh, all are sort of following um, uh, some organized uh, religion. Coworkers, larger society has its own norms of etiquette of just how, how people generally treat each other. Um, usually uh, a, a norm of fairness or turn taking, um, those types of things, uh, we hope anyway. Uh, are, are, are sort of across across uh, cultures or across social groups. Uh, but there is a potential for conflicting norms. Um, this isn't a discussion prompt, but what might be uh, a norm for one group is, is, is deviance for another. Um, so don't think that as, as a question, it's just sort of a, um, uh, thinking through uh, the norms of, of perhaps college friends and the norms of family um, and so on. So we are on now on our first discussion prompt. 
And this one is about uh, exertion of social control. So if you're getting out of line, how do your friends let you know? Or if someone in your friend group uh, is, is maybe acting out or mistreating somebody somebody else in the friend group, how, do, how does that behavior get responded to? How does it get shifted back into um, sort of appropriate behavior? So first discuss it in terms of your friends. Um, so what would happen if someone in the friend in your friend group uh, broke norms, acted out of line, mistreated another friend? Um, what would be the consequences? And again, these aren't often aren't uh, uh, sort of formal like government go to jail types of, uh, of consequences, but there are social consequences or social sort of redirections of getting someone back in line. Um, so how, how would that look for your specific group of friends? Uh, so if you, if you have multiple groups of friends, pick one and go with that. And then second, how might your family um, operate in a, in a similar type of situation? So if, if someone's sort of having bad behavior or, or mistreating another family member, uh, what, uh, what types of consequences or what types of exertion of social control would take place within your family? Would, would parents sit down and have a talk? Would it be siblings? How might that get uh, worked out so that the behave the air quote bad behavior gets redirected or shifted um, back into the positive side of things. So discuss uh, those two those two types of groups and the exertion of social control or a return to um, the social norms of the group. All right. Uh, next, we'll talk about deviance in as a norm. So. There are some groups uh, in, in, in society where, so, where uh, following norms of larger society uh, isn't what they're, what they're after. So gangs, air quote, the bad crowd, soccer hooligans, drinking buddies, heckling players, refs, coaches, and fans in an arena, all of those are the norm, but they're, they're oftentimes seen as deviants uh, by the larger society. So this would be um, those... I don't know, perhaps annoying fans or fans that go over the line, um, maybe within their group of, of loud and boisterous fans, that's the norm of you're supposed to make it hard on the other team or hard on the refs or whatever the case might be, um, where deviance is actually what they're going after. Uh, and this also happens if, if, if we think about it a little bit differently in, in sports culture in general, uh, where deviance is the norm. So drug abuse, hyper training, cutting weight, uh, particularly for things like wrestling, um, playing through pain. Uh, it, it's uh, that you can't have a wedge in, in football and kickoffs anymore. And, and wedge is just a formation where it's, it's a high contact play on kickoffs. Um, so you can't have that anymore, but they used to have it where it's effectively an arrowhead of, of blockers coming forward and someone had to just sacrifice their body and slam into that wedge to kind of break it up to, so that you could tackle the, the ball carrier behind the wedge. Uh, but that all these types of things, putting yourself in harm's way, hurting yourself um, some, in some cases intentionally uh, as part of play, um, drug abuse, hyper training, all of those would be seen as deviant um, behaviors in larger society. So if someone's abusing drugs, uh, that is not normal, uh, that's against social etiquette and, and perhaps against uh, rules of society, laws, um, pushing your body too hard, too far, too fast uh, is again seen as deviant. But within sports, those are the norms for, for many uh, subcultures within sports at least. Okay, on to female gymnasts and ice skaters. So the norms here uh, are, are often really conflicting and, 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 and a very challenging sort of balancing act. Uh, there's a pressure to be both girl and woman. Uh, so for the woman element of it, strength, grace, mental maturity, uh, in some cases, part of the performance as a, a sexual nature to it or, or, or presenting sexuality. Uh, but there's also a pressure uh, for the athletes to present uh, characteristics of a girl. So a childish femininity, um, like a doll, almost dressed up, uh, subservient, um, part of the competition um, might, uh, it might be beneficial to weigh as little as possible, um, oftentimes having an underdeveloped body for their age. Um, so there's these two sort of polarized uh, versions of female that are both needing to happen are norms of them, um, are, are expectations of them, of these athletes uh, pulling in these two different directions. 
So the sacrifice that, that, that's presented in the readings talks about lost childhood, eating disorders, delayed puberty, weakened bones, psychological harm. Um, and then all of this, uh, that psychological harm, um, these enormous successes and enormous failures are all laid on the shoulders of 13 year olds. Um, so they're not um, even fully sort of uh, developed adults with maybe a, a fully developed cognitive system that can handle failures of that of that magnitude. Um, so it's all on this early teenager um, sort of taking in all of these enormous challenges of physical challenges on one side, but also psychological challenges and dealing with having to deal with sort of delaying um, uh, for female athletes, delaying womanhood um, in this weird sort of gray area of between girl and woman. All right, so your second discussion prompt. Uh, this seems like a really, really unhealthy set of norms to put on someone. Um, who would we see as to blame for this? Is it the athletes themselves? Is it their parents? Is it their coaches? Is it the Olympic committee? Is it the media? Is it the audience? Um, so, so think through all of these pressures on, uh, on ice skaters or gymnasts and all of the um, strain physically and mentally that gets placed on them in the, in the competing norms that they're having to sort of live with, um, where's the blame lie? And then the second element of it, more importantly, can it be fixed? And how might that, how might that work? Okay, moving on to harm to children and youth sports. So here we're thinking of pr other pressures on young athletes. Oftentimes these come from family and come from coaches. Uh, so family norms, there might be reputation, they might have older siblings or parents that were had high um, athletic success. Uh, there's pressures just to please mom and dad, make them proud. Oftentimes, uh, when these, these pressures uh, become too mounting, we, we see burnout, uh, is, especially if uh, mom and dad or other family members are pressing for more and more and more and more, uh, and the child is just tired of it. Um, so the norms that are, are, con are connected with these family norms, especially, are overtraining, uh, continued play despite the desire to quit, uh, and that's where we see the burnout, uh, and undue anxiety or pressure to succeed. Uh, on, the coaching, on the coaching and team expectation side, the, the sort of the mentality is we need you, uh, so the pressure is not to let the coach down or not to let your teammates down, and again, we see overtraining, uh, perhaps self-harm, drug abuse, drug use, uh, pushing the body farther than it, sh than it's, than it sh should go or it's capable of going uh, into dangerous levels, not just pressing yourself to get better, but uh, pushing yourself to the, to the point where you're, you're, you're doing more harm than good. Um, so again, outside pressures on the athletes to um, always do more. So hypertraining is, is, is an outcome of this to please parents or coaches. Um, eating disorders, painkillers are, are outcomes of this, unhealthy ties between success and self-worth. And this is where we start to see it get wrapped up with this identity theory of, of pleasing others, pleasing others. And if you don't please others, then you have a lowered sense of identity and identity getting tied in with athletic success. Um, and then what happens when you're no longer an athlete or you experience failures, your identity, get, your identity takes a ding. So let's get into our third discussion prompt. What is the root of parents driving young athletes to unhealthy behaviors? So certainly if, if you sit down with a parent, um, most likely they wouldn't say that, yes, I'm encouraging my child to do unhealthy behaviors and harm themselves. Um, so what, what, what's driving this? Where, where is this all coming from? Uh, and what can be done about that? So once you've sort of dissected uh, sort of the, maybe the, the psychological mechanisms that are firing um, to, to, to drive these young athletes to unhealthy behaviors. Uh, think about possible solutions, what might help that, um, and then what role do, do media professionals play? Uh, or what role does the media play in this um, just more broadly? Uh, so hop over to your discussion window, complete your third discussion prompt, uh, and then come on back. All right, uh, on to uh, some NFL players or just uh, drug abuse at, at where deviance is the norm. Uh, it, so it's certainly beyond the NFL that has this, um, but we see it a lot where NFL players are addicted to pain painkillers and the mentality that norm of got to do whatever it takes to stay on the field. Um, you could, and, and it's oftentimes uh, very true that if, if you're not on the field, someone else takes your job, 
uh, and then you don't just come back and get it back. Um, so there is a, 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 a norm of it, a culture of it, but then there's also sort of the reality of you only have um, maybe a, a few years or several year, years where you have a chance to be on the field. Um, Oftentimes, there's most players have a pretty short career and retirement benefits start at uh, begin at three, um, sometimes four years into the league. Um, so there's certainly a pressure to get to that, uh, get to that number where you can start having retirement benefits uh, from the league. So taking painkillers, playing through pain, um, getting enough games played to to qualify. Um, rampant abuse during playing days. Um, Oftentimes in baseball, we hear stories of just a big barrel of pills and you just reach in like you're grabbing a handful of popcorn, um, ungoverned uh, use after, after the playing days. Um, once someone retires from the NFL or Major League Baseball, um, it's, it's very little tracking is done. Uh, and there's where we see all sorts of problems of physical addiction, but also the mental um, challenges when it, when it comes to the loss of identity of, of being connected with ath athleticism and, and the sport and your athlete identity. Uh, in addition that if, if with all the um, physical torment that you've put your body through all those years, uh, as you get older, the pain only gets worse. So there, there's still the physical desire or the body's wanting to, to feel better um, and, and painkillers can, can help fill that gap. Um, Adderall, another element of this, of sort of the, the deviant being the norm in, in some sports of getting a, a hyper focus or, or being sort of sharper on the field. The um, example is greenies. And again, in, in, in baseball, this has come up a number of times, but other sports as well, where um, it's just sort of loose, un ungoverned use in locker rooms. All right, altered priorities. So here we have the societal norm of don't do drugs, don't abuse medicine. And then major athletics, we have got to get back on the field. It's only for a little while. Um, and then also we have societal norm of don't alter your body's natural development, but the gymnastic norm of must meet this impossible standard of girl woman duality. And this brings us to our final discussion prompt uh, of this lecture. I'm sorry, not the final of the, of for the week, but the final of this lecture, I'd like you to pick a side regarding athletes harming themselves to get an edge and argue that side. So one side is it's their choice to do harm to their own bodies. Uh, they can always choose not to play. It's not our choice. Therefore, it's not our problem. Uh, so it effectively leaves it up to the individual. It's not my job to govern um, an NFL linebacker if, if he wants to take a bunch of pills to play better and, and get an edge in competition. Um, that's his business. If it harms him the rest of his life or maybe cuts his life shorter or whatever the consequence, um, that wasn't my choice. So it's not my problem to deal with. That's one side. Um, the second side is we have a responsibility to others, especially the youth, um, you, young athletes. Uh, we need to reduce, eliminate harm that they are doing to themselves. Uh, so pick one side and, and argue it. Um, give me a, a good paragraph on, on why, why that side might be uh, the direction we should go or the, or the mentality we should have toward these things. All right, that is it for this lecture. Be sure to also watch the second lecture and, and execute the discussion prompts from that one as well.